Well, hello, Freedom House. It's so good to see all of you here. Uh, we had no power this weekend. Um, was anybody else didn't have power? I guess it was just us and Sheridan. And, um, you know, when you don't have power, you sit and think about all the things you could do if you had power. You know, you look around and you think, oh, I could vacuum. No, I can't vacuum. Oh, I could do this. I could go on the computer. No, I can't do that. Uh, you know, and every light switch you're trying to turn on. And, you know, the, the great thing is that this power that the Lord Jesus has given us never goes out. And it can't be turned off. Uh, it is a power and energy within us, a spiritual energy that just um, keeps magnifying and keeps growing and it makes us new. The Lord doesn't want any of us to stay the same. He's making us new. Uh, and he's doing that to give us the best life possible. Well, my uh, sermon tonight is called The Power of Restoration because uh, that's what our God is all about, is restoring us. And in 2 Corinthians 1, 21 through 22, it says, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So to be anointed is to set apart a person, place, or thing for a divine use. And it's meant to empower people to accomplish God's work. And that's what His Holy Spirit does in us. We have a seal on us. We have an invisible tattoo that God sees when He looks at us. And it's this seal that He's given us, this guarantee that he is with us. Now we see that in the life of Joseph. He's been anointed by God to do a great work. And last week we talked about how Joseph was taken from the pit to the palace. Literally, he was taken from prison. He had the opportunity to interpret a dream for Pharaoh. And this dream, he told him that there was going to be seven years of abundance in the land, and then there was going to be seven years of a severe famine. And what they needed to do was to reserve 20% in the good seven years of the grain so they would have plenty of grain in the bad years when there was no food. So Pharaoh liked Joseph's plan, and he rewarded him for that plan. He made him second in command in Egypt. He gave him his own chariot. He had a gold uh, chain around his neck. He had beautiful robes to wear. And not only that, he gave him a wife. So uh, Joseph gets to have a family of his own. He's 30 now. And he and his wife are blessed with two sons. So Joseph names his first son Manasseh, which means God has made me forget all my troubles and my father's household. And he names his second son Ephraim, which means God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Isn't he original? I mean, no Tom, Dick, or Harry for him, right? Um, the heavyweight champion, George Foreman, named all five of his sons George Edward Foreman. He said so they would have something in common. And can you imagine calling them all to dinner? I guess just, hey, George, dinner's ready. Uh, the seven years of abundance happened just like God revealed that they would happen. And now uh, Joseph is in the second year of the famine. And not only is the famine in Egypt, but it is reaching all around the world. And it has also reached his brothers and fathers in Canaan. So in Genesis 42, 1 through 2, when Jacob heard that the grain was available in Egypt, he said to his sons, why are you standing around looking at one another? 
I've heard there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy enough grain to keep us alive. Otherwise, we'll die. So sometimes the Bible can be funny. Uh, Jacob sounds just like a parrot. Why are you standing around here looking at each other? Right? He's saying, do I have to do everything for you? And basically he's saying, I'm not going to feed you like a baby bird. Go out there and get us some grain before we die. So Genesis uh, 42, 3 through 5. So Joseph's 10 older brothers went down to Egypt to buy grain. But Jacob wouldn't let Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin, go with them. Now Benjamin, um, Joseph and Benjamin had the same mother. And she was the favorite of Jacob. Uh, and then she died. And so the, Benjamin and Joseph were very precious to him. Uh, he said, for fear some harm might come to him. So Jacob's sons arrived in Egypt along with others to buy food, for the famine was in Canaan as well. So Joseph was the governor of the land, and he's the one who sold the grain to the people. And it just so happens that he is in the right time, in the right place, and here come his brothers. You can imagine what Joseph is feeling, because you've all had that feeling Someone has hurt you deeply, and suddenly you see them. Your heart is pounding, and you suddenly feel weak in your knees, and no words are coming. Your mouth is dry. And you've rehearsed that scenario over and over in your mind. What would happen if you meet this person? Well, Joseph recognizes his brothers, but they do not recognize him. And do you know why? Because he walked like an Egyptian. <laughs> Where's my Egyptian? There he is. <laughs> so the brothers bow down low before him. And Joseph can't help but think about the dream he had as a young boy, where the stalks of grain of the brothers were bowing down to his stalk of grain. And then... His brothers give silver, and he thinks about how they took 20 shekels of silver to sell him as a slave. And Joseph speaks harshly to them like a stranger. He says, you are spies. You have come here to see that our land is unprotected. And the brothers loudly protest, no, no, no. We're honest men. We're not spies. Genesis 42 says, Sir, they said, there are actually 12 of us. We, your servants, are all brothers, sons of a man living in the land of Canaan. Our youngest brother is back there with our father right now. And one of our brothers is no longer with us. So Joseph plays a little cat and mouse with them. And, you know, who could blame him after all he has been through? Joseph is only human. And he wants to test them to see if they have changed and if they have any remorse for the way that they have treated him. So he tells the brother that they're lying. And in order for him to know that they're not lying, he wants to see the youngest brother, Benjamin. And Joseph puts all the brothers in the same prison that he was in. And he lets them sit in there for three days. Then he brings them out, and he says, Do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here and return with your youngest brother. Oh, the brothers are beyond upset. Because when they came and told their father that Joseph had gotten killed, their father has grieved and grieved and grieved and never stopped grieving. And they know that he will not let go. Of Benjamin. In Genesis 42, 21 through 22, speaking among themselves, they said, Clearly, we are being punished because of what we did to Joseph long ago. We saw his anguish when he pleaded for his life, but we wouldn't listen, and that's why we're in this trouble. Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? Reuben asked, the oldest brother, but you wouldn't listen. And now we have to answer 
for his blood. Well, the brothers don't realize that Joseph knows every word that they're saying. Be sure your sins will find you out. You can try to hide a sin, but it will come to the surface. The brothers have buried the sin, and it's still there because it's unconfessed sin. If you have unconfessed sin in your life, you don't have to carry that burden. You can bring that to Jesus, and Jesus will forgive that, so you don't have to carry that heaviness anymore. You can bring it out into the light. Well, Joseph has to turn away from his brothers because as they're talking about what happened to him and he realizes that, hey, they are feeling bad about what they did, and he starts to cry. So he turns away from them so they they don't see him. The Lord was with Joseph, but deep is the pain that has been inflicted on him. And it was inflicted on him by people that he trusted. And so that pain goes even deeper in him. He's wrestling with his own emotions. And when an injustice happens to you at an early age, it's hard to forget. It's, it just seems to be ingrained in your memory. Tears are God's release vow for healing. He put that, those tears so you can release that hurt and that sorrow. And as the brothers get ready to leave, Joseph says that Simeon, the brother, is going to stay, and he throws him into prison. And without the brothers knowing it, he instructs his servants to take the silver that they brought for the grain and to put it back in their sacks. Joseph is putting the fear of God into them. It's not until the brothers get home and they open their sacks that they see the silver. And they are beside themselves. Oh no, what is going to happen? It looks like we stole the silver. And um, so they go and they tell the brother, I mean the father, that they're going to have to go back to Egypt. And that when they do, that... Joseph is asked for them to bring Benjamin. He doesn't know that it's Joseph, though. So the father is upset, and he says, Well, you've deprived me of Joseph, and now Simeon? And you're asking me to let you take Benjamin? If something happens to him, I'll go to my grave. So the famine continued, and the brothers and their father had to return to Egypt for more grain. Not the father, but the brothers did. So Judah, one of the brothers, makes a promise to the father. And he says, if you'll let us take Benjamin, I will take all the blame. I will be the one I will ask to take his place. So the father doesn't want them all to die because if they don't have grain, they're going to die. So they take some of their best products to give to Joseph and they double the amount of the silver And when they get to Egypt, of all things, they're invited into Joseph's house for dinner. They're thinking, oh, why are we going to his house for dinner? And then they notice that the table is set from the oldest to the youngest. It's in birth order. And they're like, well, that's odd. How would they know our birth order? When Joseph sees Benjamin, he asks, is this the youngest brother? And then he starts to cry again, and he has to actually leave and leave the room and go into another room because he's starting to cry. After Joseph washes his face, he returns, and they have a great time eating dinner together. And the next day, Joseph has the servants fill the sacks of grain, And he hides the doubled silver. And he also has them put his silver cup in one sack, in Benjamin's sack. So Joseph instructs his servants that they're to wait just a little while, and then they're to go out after his brothers, and they're to say to him, why have you done this evil thing and taken my master's cup? Well, the brothers had not gone far from the city, When the servant comes riding up 
And he says, how could you have stolen from my master? And the brothers, they start objecting. Oh, no, we're not thieves. We wouldn't take anything. Didn't we return that silver? And um, so the the servant says, well, I'm going to check your bags. And they're like, yes, check our bags. And if you find that silver cup, whose ever bag that silver cup is in will become your slave. So as they're opening up those bags, they go down from oldest to youngest, and who has the silver cup? Benjamin. And the brothers, they just go beside themselves. They start tearing out their hair and tearing their clothes, like, oh no, how are we going to tell our father what's happened? So the brothers are taken back to face Joseph, and they're begging him, Do not take Benjamin. And Judah is the one who becomes the spokesman. And he's the one that when Joseph was about to be um, sold, he says, what will we gain if we kill our brother? Let's sell him to the slave traders. Now, you know, Joseph has heard Judah. He heard him say that. And now Judah, who has ignored Joseph's pleas for help, is asking Joseph for help. So what do you do? When you've got the power and your words determine what happens to the destiny of your enemy, the positions are completely changed. And now Joseph holds his brother's fate in his hands. Joseph can pay them back. He can have revenge or He can pay the way forward for his family. God is a forward motion God. He's always moving us forward. And he's moving us forward to the future. Joseph holds in his hands the future of not only his brothers, but God's plan. His brothers represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And God is going to bring Christ through their family line. This is a promise that he made to Abraham, their grandfather. And Satan is trying to destroy God's plan, but Joseph listens to God's voice, and he forgives. And what a picture for all of us of the grace of Christ. We come before Christ, and we plead our case, And we don't deserve to be forgiven. And yet Christ goes through all the harm and pain that in suffering he goes through to release us from our sin and to give us forgiveness. There is nothing we can do. And he asks that we also give grace to those who hurt us. Genesis 45, 1 through 2, Joseph could stand it no longer. There were many people in the room, and he said to his attendants, Out, all of you! And so he was alone with his brothers when he told them who he was. And then he broke down and wept. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians could hear him, and word of it quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please come closer, he said to them. And so they came closer, and he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all Egypt. And then Joseph looks over and he sees Benjamin. And he runs and he grabs Benjamin and hugs him, uh, this little brother, that that he's been separated from all this time. And then he goes to each brother, and then he kisses each brother. And then he talks to each brother and asks how they were and how life has been. 
And he tells them that the famine is going to last another five years and that he wants them to go home and get their father and to bring him back. So Joseph uh, gets them these cards and they put some of the finest things of Egypt on the cards and the brothers um, get to leave and go and get the father. So um, they go to get the father and there's this scene in, in the Bible as you're reading this in Genesis where um, all of a sudden the father is coming along and he's been, it's a long journey. When they tell him that Joseph is alive, it's like he's revitalized and he's, he can't wait to go and see this son that he thought was dead. Imagine if you'd had a child and you thought they were dead and then you got to go see them and they were alive or someone you loved. And so here Joseph's father is, he's making this long journey. He's an old, old man, uh, over a hundred. And um, then Joseph goes out to meet him. He hears that they're coming. Joseph gets his chariot. He comes to meet his dad. He sees his dad's chariot and he gets out of that chariot and he comes running to his father and he embraces him. And he cries for a long time, letting out that pain of never thinking that he was going to see his father. And we see the goodness of God. We see the goodness of God, that God cares about restoration, that he knew that Joseph needed that, that he needed to be with his father again. Well, <clears throat> Joseph gets to be with his father for a while, and Pharaoh blesses them, and they give them some land. And there's actually like about 70 of them uh, with the wives and the children, and everybody comes together. So his two boys get to have an extended family now. And then uh, the father dies, and the brothers get together, and they're like, uh-oh, we're in trouble now. He was just being nice to us while our father was alive. But now the hammer is going to come down. I'm just sure of it. So they come and they meet before Joseph and they say, you know, please, please have mercy on us. We'll be your slaves. And in Genesis 50, 19 through 20, but Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. God was with Joseph in the bad. And now Joseph refuses to play God when things are good. Joseph becomes a healthier person. The power of restoration is not only that you will become healthy, but the rest of your family will become healthy. Your example will lead them to Christ, and you can break the generational chains. That dysfunctional family becomes less and less as we have Christ in our lives. And that's our hope, isn't it? Is that our children and our children's children will not carry that dysfunction on to the next generation. And our hope as Christ followers is that that generation will become stronger. And we say, I'm going to forgive the people from my past so I can give to the people in my life what they deserve. If you allow God to heal you, you can give more to the people in your life and you can be healthier. And um, Rudy is uh, going to come up and talk to us tonight. And um, he's such a great example of the power of restoration. Let's give him a hand. Hi, hi. Well, thank you, Kathy. So Kathy invited me to, uh, to, you know, to tell you a little bit of my pit in my palace, because I've had both. I have both. Uh, uh, I think my pit starts at you know very early age. My dad's uh, and my uh, my parents went through divorce when I was five, and then uh, 
uh, you know, my dad was a womanizer, so that led us to, to move from one house to the other, to the other, to the other. And, you know, I think they call them, they call those foster homes, right? But in Nicaragua, there's no, no foster homes. You just, I was just raised by, by, by whoever, you know, he had at the moment. He, he, changed, it. he changed girlfriends like, like there was no, <laughs> there was no, 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 no filter in him. So, um, there was, there was a, a relationship that lasted a, a long time, and, uh, and uh, I had two sisters from that relationship, and then, uh, and then they, they split again, and then I didn't understand, you know, the, why my sister had to go when they split, you know, and, uh, and even though I, I tried to make a, stay in touch with my sisters, they, they always told me that, uh, that I had nothing with them, you know, that, that you know, you're not, you know, part of our family, so I had to give that up. And then I got into a relationship, it was a toxic relationship, and I had a daughter, and at three and a half years old, uh, I was pretty much, you know, having a lot of, I had an obsession with drugs and alcohol. It was like, I, I just didn't, I, I couldn't just, you know, do anything for fun. It was really, I did it with a passion. And that took me to jails, institutions, and you know, almost death, almost death. They say jails, institutions, and death. It almost took me to death. Uh, um, so at three and a half years old, when my when my daughter turned uh, three and a half years old, I was so deep into my addiction that they told me uh, my my the, my significant other said, you know what, we can we can do this. You know, either you have to get. Uh, your act together or, or, or be with us. And the power of the addiction was so strong that I, I chose the, the, the drugs. I chose the drugs. And, uh, and after a while, you know, it, it kind of like ate me up a little bit. Uh, I, I mean, not a little bit, a lot. And I wanted to, to get in touch with my daughter. And, uh, but, you know, I couldn't, uh, since I wasn't working, they, they always told me, if you don't pay child support, you don't, you know, you don't get to see her. I did not know that I had rights, you know, and all I had to do is was stay clean and sober for about two weeks so I could go to court, but every court date, every, every uh, meetings that they said, I always, I always cancel, I called, or I didn't even show her, no show, no call. So they finally took my, my rights as a parent, you know, they took my rights away. And, and that led me to a deeper, deeper passion with a, with a, I pretty much, uh, I married drugs and alcohol. It was my, my, I did nothing but drugs and, and, uh, and crimes and all that stuff. So I guess my palace starts when, when I come to recovery, I come to recovery and, uh, and I did go to, you know, secular uh, AA meetings, NA meetings and stuff like that. And it kept me clean and sober, but but there was something missing. There was something missing that I didn't know what. I, I had a sponsor. I did everything that they said, and uh, and I, uh, I, I, it was. I, it always felt empty. So I heard, you know, because I had to do this community service to pay for my court fines, what I owed the courts. Uh, my my probation officer. Uh, told me, hey, you know, I know about this uh, program, Celebrate Recovery. You know, they, they, you can, you can do community service there, right? So, I went into community service there, and man, and when I, when, when I got introduced to Jesus, man, it was like, oh, it was kind of like skeptical a little bit, but you know, as I, I get to know him, I get to know him more and more. It was like, oh man, I like this, I like this, because uh, that emptiness started fading away. It was, and it's in the promises. And the big book of, of AA, the, the, they have the promises when, in, and there is this one part says that, that you know, after a while, you, you, all the feeling of emptiness will, will start fading away, and God will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And that was so amazing because, you know, God was doing for me what I couldn't do for myself until I started learning through other people. I mean, through you guys, I, uh, I, I didn't know how to have a... A healthy relationship, because I always, they used to call me bomb magnet. My parents called me bomb magnet because I always got in these toxic relationships. And, and uh, so, so when I finally led the, uh, uh, I left that to God, God, you know what, if there's a relationship there for me, please, you know, you, you be the one choosing it because 
I don't know how to pick my picker. It's, it's messed up. Uh, so before, before I met Tracy, man, God put some amazing women in my life because God knew my, my, my problem with women, and he needed to, to, to I needed to, to learn how to treat women before I could get into a relationship. Pastor Kath, Kathy, Pastor Carrie, Pastor Susan, Chrissy Davis, who, who is a, a celebrate recovery uh, uh, state representative. I mean, a whole bunch of women that I, I could have not done it without, you know, without Pastor Kathy. She's, she's been like a mentor for me, slash marriage counselor, slash uh, all kinds of, I don't know, you so many slashes. <laughs> So yeah, so that's where my palette starts. And then I, I got into, you know, we've been to, I've been together with Tracy eight years now, and, and it's been so awesome, so awesome. Our relationship has, has uh, I mean, it, it's like it has no end. And, and not only that, but uh, we couldn't, um, it was uh, suggested that if I wanted to, to do it the, the, the God way, we had to abstain from sex, so which was like a lot, a lot of, a, <laughs> yeah. It was like, you know when they said that the flesh is weak and the spirit is strong, right? Well, my flesh is always, is always going that way and, and, and my spirit trying to push me that way. And so anyways, and, and then not only that, but our weekly counseling with uh, our pastor Jim, yeah, who was uh, the, the, the founder of uh, Freedom House, and uh, and it was the best thing. We did it for a year, weekly, weekly. Oh my gosh, when does this end? I just <laughs> right, but it was the best thing because you know when when we finally got married, it was uh, we knew each other, we knew our our our, be our our moods, our our goods and the bads and all that stuff, and and then uh, and that that doesn't end right there. Then my daughter, at three and a half years old, then I get reunited with my with my daughter at 26 years old and pregnant. I just, I, as a matter of fact, I was in a funeral and and then she, uh, I get a, I get an email, email, and then I see it, uh, she called me Rudy. Rudy, I I want to get in a in a relationship with you, but man, a lot of people were praying for. I think I think all of you, I mean, most of you. A lot of you were praying for for that relationship to to come together and and uh, and little by little, you know what? I, I I don't feel comfortable giving you my phone number, but you can you can email me and then I took what I what I could get because I didn't want to get into a demanding stuff from her, right? And then uh, so so and then not only that, but my sis my sisters too. This last July, we uh, we got reunited, and man, it, it was so awesome. I didn't get to meet their whole family, but but my two sisters, they wanted to be in a relationship. They wonder, they you know, all the hurt that I that I that I had through all these years. They, I found out that they went through the hurt too because they wondered. I wonder why you went. You know, we never saw you. My mom did never told us uh, if you were even alive or anything like that. So. That's when my palace comes, the restoration of family. I, my dad, I made amends with my dad, even though, you know, he was the, the womanizer. I always felt guilty of, 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 I felt like I was the one cheating on my mom because I knew that he did that stuff. And, you know, I love my dad. And every time we went out, he did this stuff. And when we come back in, Oh, how you doing? You know, they'll, they'll be asking me what happened. And, and I always hate it. So I, I felt... As an adult, I feel like, oh, man, you know, I, I'm cheating on my mom, too, because I'm not telling her the truth, right? But, you know, we made amends, and now, now my dad and I, and, and, you know, we have a, it's a fun relationship, but, but you know, we talk. He, he lives in Vegas, and uh, so, yeah, a lot of, a lot of, and then I have my, my celebrate recovery family, you know, I mean, this, it's like my home. I love Celebrate Recovery. I, I can, I don't know if I, I'm not going anywhere. A lot of people, <laughs> they keep like, hey, when are you, when are you on, you're going to end uh, Celebrate Recovery, but I don't think I, I am because that's what keeps me, it's my church. Nothing against you, Pastor Kathy, but, 
Man, my church is celebrate recovery. That's where I, you know, because people, they're not, uh, they're not embarrassed to tell you, hey, I'm hurting today. You know, you ask her like, hey, how are you doing? You know, like everybody just, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. But in the, in the inside, you're not. So, and, and everybody, uh, so, so anyways, I guess I can, I can just like leave it at that. My palace, restoration of family, restoration of friendships. A beautiful wife. The material, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's just material, but, but family and friends and, and, and all that that, been, that that was lost for a long, long, long time, I get to, to, to experience it again. I was a, a, a bad father to my kids, but I get to have eight grandkids today that, man, it is so awesome. And not only that, but I can, okay, now you go home, right? <laughs> it's just like, so it's, uh, it's, it's awesome. It's beautiful. And I love also uh, bringing people to recovery and to Christ, you know. So, so there is that. Ooh, yes. Thank you guys for for letting me share. Um. Thank you, Rudy, for sharing with us, and you know how Satan tried to harm Rudy, tried to destroy Rudy, but God is using it for good and the saving of many lives. And God didn't just stop when Rudy received him into his life. He kept working, working. The spirit was working, right? The power of restoration. And that's what God wants to do in our lives. Uh, he wants to help us have those relationships. The secret of life is our relationship with God and our relationship with others. And it's just that simple. So um, tonight, I just want to say a prayer. You know, maybe there's been someone that's hurt you in your family. And um, we just pray tonight that God will give you the grace to forgive them. And that God will bring healing over that hurt. Lord, we just come to you tonight. We thank you for the power of restoration. We thank you, God, that you can heal um, any wound, God. Um, we thank you for the wounds that you took for us, Lord, at the cross so that we could be healed. And uh, Lord, um, just there's maybe that name um, all over this place of people that have been hurt. Lord, we ask for healing over these relationships, God, that you would bring restoration, God. Um, Lord, that you would heal the hurt in the hearts, God, that are there. Lord, that they could release that hurt to you, God, and release them of the death that they owe them, God, so that they can just finally be free. And Lord, you know the situation. Some things are so complicated and so deep and hurtful. Um, God, you know if that relationship, there needs to be a boundary or not. But God, I just um, ask that you would go forth over all of us, Lord, and that you would start your work in us and continue to restore in the mighty name of Jesus. Um, we just send that forth, and amen. amen. <laughs>